Hi guys, welcome to another video. This time I'll be talking about dust spotting, scratch removal and restoring old pictures. Yeah, it's the bane of my existence really. Removing all that dust from pictures. I still shoot my pictures on film. I don't really own a current digital camera. My newest digital camera for stills is like 10 years old. That's why I do a lot of dust spotting in my studio. It's just something I have to do. The reason why I'm thinking about this right now is because I was doing the liner notes for my current album Hypnagogia recently and I used some pictures for that from a project that started because of a very a film problem. A few years ago I had a batch of Pan F50 that had a lot of emulsion damage. This is a film by Ilford and I don't really know whether they've solved the problem by now but this keeps coming up on social media every now and then so I don't think it's permanently solved. It just sometimes happens that there is a bad batch like that and... Aren't clones supposed to look alike? So much for quality control. What can you do when you catch a few rolls of that stuff? In this case, I decided to do something more fine art with those rolls. And I took some of my weirdest cameras into the forest. I took my Diana F Plus for some pinholes. And I took a brownie where I flipped the lens. And, you know, I, I used it for that sort of thing, really. This allowed me to just leave the speckles in and use them in an artistic sense. And I actually enhanced some of that in post in one of the pictures that I used for the liner notes because I thought it added to the atmosphere. So sometimes you want dust and you want scratches and all of that gives a sort of atmosphere that you can't really get with digital. I get that. A lot of people leave the dust in. I normally remove all the dust because I'm primarily a documentary photographer and for that kind of thing I like to have my pictures clean. So I spend a lot of time fixing those kinds of imperfections. So I'm quite used to it. It's rather fitting that then something came across my desk that also had to do with dust removal and scratch removal. And you probably already know it from the title of the video. So let's have a look. Hi guys, I started on editing a picture that my mom sent me, a very old picture from my grandmother's wedding and it's quite in a state so I'm cleaning it all up and yeah it's very interesting. So far I've removed all the big scratches and big blemishes and tomorrow I'll remove all the dust and, and that sort of thing. That takes quite a while with such old pictures and yeah I want to do it right. I'm about halfway through now. There's just a lot of dust and fungus on it and it takes me a bit of time to repair it all. But it's gonna look really good when it's done and I think it's worth it. The reason why I'm editing this picture is because my mum is donating the dress that my grandma was wearing and I think it's gonna be perhaps on display and that's why they wanted that picture to see it in context and worn, I don't know, something like that. And it's always nice to do things like that. I love editing old pictures like that and it's always fun. It's taking a long time because it's in quite a state, but well, that's a nice distracting thing to do.
so all of that took me quite a long time. This last portion actually took two hours according to the screen recording that I made. And this is really the problem with emotional damage and old pictures like this. It takes a very long time to fix these sort of things because it's very context dependent whether the dust is easy to remove or not. And it's very dependent on what's surrounding the dust or the scratch or whatever blemish you want to remove. In this case there was a blemish right around the eye of my great-great-grandmother and that was a bit harder to fix but I managed in the end and it doesn't look out of place now. I think it works well and you can't always use the content aware fill with this sort of thing especially if there are large portions that are dusty like this or full of fungus and then that means you have to remove every little speck one by one and if there are many well that can take a very long time and then it might not look quite right and it helped that this picture was taken by an, clearly an amateur who didn't quite know how to focus the camera properly. My guess is that this was an old medium format folding camera. Maybe it didn't even have a focusing mechanism beyond just simple zone focusing. This guesstimation then led to this, you know, out of focus area right in the face of my relatives. The leaves and branches behind them are sharp, but their faces are out of focus. In this case, this actually helped me because it meant that I could at times smudge it a little instead of going detail for detail. It made it a little bit easier to remove some of the larger areas of speckles. I could use the pencil as a smudge tool and yeah, it helped quite a bit. Doing something like this for a lot of pictures is of course very annoying. And this is why I decided to use the Pan F in an artistic way where I could leave the speckles in because I didn't want to do this for rolls and rolls of film. It just takes a very long time and if you spend several hours in one picture and you have many rolls, it gets annoying. So doing this for an entire collection of pictures is a quite, quite a commitment. I've done some of that for old family pictures, but the only reason why I could do it is because in the past people just didn't take as many pictures as we would be taking now. This is in fact rather feasible for many people because they don't have that many pictures of their relatives of, you know, 50 years ago or 70 years ago or something like that. So let's just address the elephant in the room. Why didn't I use AI for this? Maybe you've seen one of those videos that promised you one-click AI restoration with the new Photoshop neural filters. And well, let me tell you, that's all snake oil and clickbait because it doesn't really work. In this case, the main problem was that I was doing this not for my mum, but for a museum. I had a historical document on my hands, which meant that I couldn't really alter it in any way that is as significant as AR restoration. And I also didn't really think that the AI features of Photoshop gave me very good results. So I tried this out and Maybe I just show you what I mean and then you see what the problem is. In Photoshop these features are still in beta, so uh, this is not in any way professional grade yet. And they are well aware of it. And if you activate it, then you will be met with something rather, yeah, creepy I would say. There are these three sliders. One is photo enhancement, one is face enhancement, and the third is scratch removal. The photo enhancement is not too bad. It removes most of the speckles, but it does it with increasing the contrast and making parts of the picture more blurry. And this picture is already quite blurry, so I would not recommend adding more blurriness to it. I wasn't really impressed with the result and I knew that I could get much better results if I just went in there with the healing brush tool. And yeah, I was not impressed with this. And the added contrast is just a fake thing that, you know, any picture looks better with more contrast. So it just convinces you that it improved the picture when it really didn't do that much. And there's still speckles left, so I would still have to go in with the healing brush and check for all the rest of the blemishes. It also doesn't do a particularly good job in areas that are difficult, like in the faces. So not impressed with the results of this slider. The second slider is where it gets really creepy. The face enhancement, it, it does a good job at sharpening and it does something to enhance it. But what comes out of it is really something that looks very human, I would say. It did an alright job with my great-great-grandmother's face. 
it looks a bit plasticky but it's it's not quite creepy but with my great grandmother it just looks like a zombie it's because her eyes are light and yeah it just it's not a good look in ai there is this concept of the uncanny valley which means that if something looks almost human but not quite it's actually creepier than if it doesn't look like a human at all so the closer it gets to actually looking human the creepier it gets this has been studied for the purposes of robotics and determines how closely robots mimic human form and there is greater acceptance for robots that don't look like humans because it just gets really creepy you get this effect also with dolls and you know your chucky and, and that sort of thing i definitely see the chucky effect and the creepy robot type thing happening here it's too creepy it's too uncanny it looks like a zombie it doesn't look right and yeah if you're doing this to connect to your relatives and your family then this is not the way to go i also watched this video about ai restoration he was doing something uh, a little different the picture that he was working on was cropped quite closely and he wanted to extend the background a bit and he used ai for that we can click on this arrow here to cycle through actually that's not bad cycle through some more examples that's kind of weird it's kind of it's added somebody else in that's kind of weird yeah that's like uh no no please don't and i don't want creepy ghosts showing up in the pictures of my relatives that i'm restoring i i don't want to associate any of that with, with my relatives and i also don't want to see my great grandmother as a zombie that's that's really not what i want so use these photoshop filters at your own risk maybe it's better if you don't use them uh it definitely gave me goosebumps of the oh god this is creepy kind and yeah no no please don't even if you dial the slider all the way back and even at 20 percent i would not give this to a museum because it already alters the image quite a bit and it also changes the context of the picture because if this picture was taken by a photographer and it was sharp and perfect and so on it would say a very different thing than this picture that was taken by some relative who didn't really know how to use the camera properly it is a document that is just a family picture and not something that was staged for a photographer i mean these cameras are quite hard to use and hard to focus even when they have a functioning focusing mechanism they are not entirely accurate sometimes and you have to know how to use them nowadays with autofocus it's very easy to take pictures that are sharp and a normal everyday picture will not tell you whether this picture was taken by a photographer or by just you know someone using autofocus but back then it said a lot and as a historical document i would not alter this it's okay that it is unsharp and that's just how it ended up and with the context of historical accuracy the last slider becomes relevant too because the scratch removal i found actually to be the most destructive slider of all of these it removes things from the picture very quickly and it, it's just a matter of branches in this case that are behind them and i mean it's not really distorting reality to such an extent but of course i can't give anything like that to a museum if it alters the picture in any way this slider actually removes my great great grandmother's ears so that's no good either so you have to use these sliders carefully and even fully to the right there are still scratches left it didn't do a particularly good job with the fold in the picture either so i'm not impressed but I have to say, uh, in defense of this AI, the problem is that this is really genuinely hard to do. I sometimes struggle to discern what is a scratch and what is a branch myself. I have this guessing game going on. Is this dust or is this a twig? And is this a speckle or is this just grit on the street? I'm always asking these questions. They're not easy to answer. And if I can't do it, then an AI has probably less chances at the moment. Maybe one day they're going to be better at it than us, but they're definitely not there yet. And I would not entrust my pictures to them. And of course, I'm showing you here that I like listening to records. I have old film cameras that are 100 years old. 
if you think now that I'm a full-on Luddite, then, um, well, I also have a robotics degree and I actually studied computing in AI at university. So I know a thing or two about AIs. I always joke that my most important contribution to the survival of humanity is that I stopped working in robotics. And it's the kind of joke that, uh, you know, sort of gets stuck in your throat a bit and you, you laugh very nervously about it because it is essentially true. I mean, drones kill a lot of people and yeah, we really don't want any more advances in this area. We are already well equipped with all sorts of stuff that can kill us. We don't need to add robots to the mix. They will truly be our friends. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans. <laughs> no, I take it back. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't think that we should be handing off all our pursuits to machines and our creative pursuits uh, even less so. Of course, AI is rather impressive nowadays. They can write convincing jingles and make art that is impressive. Recently, I saw the profile picture of one of my subscribers and I was genuinely amazed at how cool this, this profile picture looked. I told them that the, their profile picture was amazing and they said it was AI and I was like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's how it goes nowadays. AI does pretty amazing art sometimes and is that good? Is that bad? I don't know. I think our job nowadays becomes curation if we use these kinds of tools and it's fine to use AI in your art if you want to do that but I personally like to have a more tactile, haptic, old-fashioned way of interacting with my art. I like developing film and I like doing this sort of thing. It connects me to my art and I would not want an AI to do this for me. This took hours and it was okay that it took hours. And a bit of patience helps. I mean, wouldn't we all like to have an AI that could just fix all our problems in one click? There are certainly things that I would want to fix in that way. But sadly, reality doesn't always play ball like that. And AI isn't there yet. If you're interested in the technique, for larger areas I sometimes use the content-aware fill. And this can work sometimes quite well and sometimes it doesn't work at all. It depends on the context of the picture. But in many cases with small speckles you just have to go in there with a more fine-grained tool. It's tempting to use a spot healing brush for this, but it has these content-aware options that are a bit too intelligent for its own good sometimes. I find that I have better results with the healing brush or with the clone tool, where you can sample an area of the picture and then apply that elsewhere. Especially helps in areas where there are edges or little details like that. It's not doing any sort of AI intelligent assumptions that might not fit your picture. It's easier to be in control with just a simple clone tool. This also makes it feasible to do this with a free tool. I'm using Photoshop, which can be quite expensive. I think it's about 33 euros a month at the moment, I believe, and I don't think that's really necessary for a job like that. You can also use just a simple free program. For example, GIMP would work for this, and it's really not that difficult to do. You sample a uniform area and then clone from there, and it takes a long time, but it works just as well. And in the end, I have the best results with these old-fashioned ways of doing things, and it works better for me to remove dust and scratches and everything like that. You see me using my iPad as a drawing tablet, and I'm using an Apple Pencil that is pressure sensitive, and this helps to be a bit more fine-grained with the removal of certain things, but you don't really necessarily need something like this. I used to do this with a mouse or with a trackpad. It's just easier with an iPad or with a drawing tablet. And that has been really helpful for me to speed up the process a little bit. This is kind of the film equivalent of pixel peeping and you look at your pictures at a very high magnification and it helps. I sometimes go in even to 200% so that I can actually have the fine control with the pencil and catch the dust at the right angle. So that helps too sometimes. If you're now thinking, why don't I just leave the dust in? Well, normally when I take pictures it's not quite as bad as this. 
I usually scan my pictures right away so that they don't accumulate dust and there is usually not so much dust on my pictures and I just think that leaving it in, especially with documentary work, seems a little bit lazy and that's why I remove it. You can also choose to leave all this stuff in but if you don't like scratches or if there are bigger blemishes or if you have old pictures like this where it's just way too intrusive then you will have to do something like this and it just takes time but it's perfectly doable and anyone can learn it. Sometimes I don't enjoy doing this sort of thing and then I procrastinate on editing my pictures for a long time and then I get into a flow of things and there's some lovely podcasts about film photography that I listen to while I do this. Sometimes I listen to audiobooks and in many ways it brings me closer to my pictures. I noticed this also with this picture of my great-great-grandmother. I actually had never seen a picture of her before and even though I have never seen her before, I now feel like I know her face because I spend so much time cleaning up this picture and I now feel a little bit more connected to my family history. So that's also quite nice. So even though it takes a lot of time, this is also something nice that you can do to connect with your pictures on a deeper level. So this is not my absolutely favorite thing to do, <laughs> not by a long shot, but I sometimes quite like doing it. And in this case, it made me feel more connected to my family. So that was actually not bad to be doing this. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. If you enjoyed it, then please leave a like and subscribe if you haven't done so already. It really helps out my channel, so I would really appreciate it. If you like the music on this video, then you can check out my band camp in the description below where you can find my latest album Hypnagogia and also my first album Endless Nights. You will have heard Endless Nights uh, a lot on my channel because I use that a lot for my photography videos as my background music. So if you enjoyed the music on those videos, do check out the Bandcamp. It's a really good way of supporting me. You can also support me on Ko-fi. There are different membership tier options where you can get early access to my videos or also download the music on them. All your support keeps this channel running and it allows me to spend time on these videos so that I can bring you more of them. Thank you a lot for all your support. It really helps. There will be more videos like this in the future and I already edited some pictures for another point of view video so that will be coming out soon. In any case, I hope I see you soon for another video. Bye!